speaking of Ramadan, tonight we have the pleasure of hosting a conversation with two of this country's best known Muslim authors and media creators who are doing incredible work. And the discussion tonight will focus specifically on this fantastic book by Sarkha Nawaz. It's uh, called Jamila Green Ruins Everything. It's a phenomenal satire and a dark comedy that takes a stab at the hypocrisy of American foreign policy in the Middle East. It's a fabulous book. It's really funny. I recommend you all get a copy immediately. Uh, we have a bunch of copies at the VPL, but there's a long list of holds. I think 28 holds last time I checked on five copies. So you probably want to get your own copy. And it's also the kind of book that you're going to want to underline and keep in your bookshelf forever. So I encourage you to go buy this copy or buy this book. So I'm excited to introduce today's speakers. So Sarka, Omar, can you please join me on stage? Hello. Hey. Um, Sarka is a Canadian film and television producer, public speaker, and journalist, and former broadcaster. Uh, you might know her as a creator of the hit CBC comedy series, The Little Mosque on the Prairie, which was the fir world's first sitcom about a Muslim community living in the West. It's incredible. And you might have also read her memoir uh, called uh, Laughing All the Way to the Mosque, which was shortlisted for a number of awards. Also, fun fact, Sarka is about to launch a new comedy series on television called Also Sarka, and it's coming to CBC Gem this year, so she can tell us when that's hitting the, the airwaves. Uh, she lives in Regina, Saskatchewan with her family. So thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And Omar Mualem is an award-winning writer and filmmaker. Uh, his journalism has appeared in The Guardian, The New Yorker, The Rolling Stone, MacLean's, Wired, and many more. Um, he co-authored the national bestseller, Inside the Inferno, which was about the firefighters who saved Fort McMurray during the big fire of 2016. And he also co-directed Digging in the Dirt, which was a documentary about mental health in the Alberta oil patch. Now in 2020, he founded the Pandemic University School of Writing. And this past October, we were honored to host him on this very stage to talk about his latest book, Praying to the West, which you might remember looks like this, also a phenomenal book. So I also encourage you to go get this one. Uh, so what they're gonna do now is they're gonna have a conversation for about 40 minutes and they're gonna take questions from the audience at the end. So for the audience, if you have questions, please use the Q&A button to submit them because it helps us keep them organized and see who's asking what. You'll also be able to upvote each other's questions so you don't have to repeat yourselves. Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, you've never used the Q&A button, the chat is totally fine. We'll figure it out. Um, anyway, let's get this conversation started. Omar, take it away. Oh, well, thank you so much, Jorge, and welcome everybody. It is good to be back uh, virtually uh, to the VPL. Um, so thank you so much. I'm, I'm so thrilled to, to be talking to you, Zarka, today about your new novel, which really is unlike anything else I've read. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to try to, to summarize the plot without any, you know, major spoilers for, for folks who haven't read it yet, but it's a, about a shallow, modern American Muslim woman who is convinced that her dreams of being a number one best-selling author will be answered if she does one good deed and that one good deed is how she ends up in Syria joining an ISIS-like terrorist movement known as the Dominion of the Islamic Caliphate and Kingdom or Dick. <laughs> so it's uh, it's zany, it's unpredictable satire of some pretty serious subject matter, um, but it's also an aggressive critique of Western foreign policy. So I have a lot of questions, but <clears throat> before we get to them, I thought it would be really great if we can get a sampling of it. I mean, it's really all about, you know, all about your voice, all about the comedy. So if uh, if you would, I would, I would love it if you could read a short passage. Please. Absolutely. I'm just going to grab my reading glasses. They're right here. That's right. And quickly throw back another date <laughs> you said as an excuse uh, it's okay it's stopping me from overeating as you know it's a big problem in ramadan i was actually reading this study that 60 percent of muslims gain weight oh yeah in ramadan oh, yes. because we overdo it yeah but, uh five thousand yeah. calories in a five hour window <laughs> is not a you healthy can, thing to do you can make up for the whole day yeah. very very quickly Okay, I'm going to read chapter three because it's a little shorter and it's a bit zanier. It's um, when Jamila and Ibrahim are going to be heading out to take care of a homeless person. So here is chapter three. 
Do we have any juice boxes? Asked, asked Jamila as she threw a loaf of bread and some apples into a knapsack. Lily was measuring cut up cauliflower. It had been two days since the book launch and Jamila felt Ibrahim had the power to put a curse on her if she didn't feed the homeless. I threw them out last year when dad got diagnosed with diabetes, Lily said. Plus the straws are bad for the environment. Why? I thought they'd be convenient for the homeless to drink from, but we wouldn't want to trigger Armageddon too early. I'll just take some leftover coffee. Jamila poured the last dregs from her coffee maker into the thermos. They can drink it straight out of the bottle, like booze. You're taking stale coffee and giving it to the homeless, asked Lily slowly. Since when did you start caring for people? Jamila pretended she didn't hear. Maybe I can offer some leftover steak from last night's dinner too, said Jamila, as she reached into the fridge. The, the garage door rumbled and Murray emerged with a picket ball racket over his shoulder. Jamila greeted him at the front door with a piece of steak on a fork. You weren't planning on eating this, were you? She asked. I love you too, replied Murray, setting down the racket and kissing her on the lips. You can have it. Jamila headed back to the kitchen and started to slice it up. It's not moldy, so it should be fine. How was your game? Asked Lily as she sauteed some mushrooms and cauliflower. Pulled a muscle while yanking a bicus bicuspid. I'll try again next week. What's happening? Murray asked Lily while throwing a glance at Jamila. You're making up lame excuses not to exercise. I'm making you a stir fry with a recommended amount of vegetables according to the USDA food guide food guideline, she said. And mom is attempting to feed the homeless by giving them questionable meat in a baggie. Murray turned just in time to see Jamila put the pieces of meat into a Ziploc bag. That's great, said Murray, especially after you said you'd never help a homeless person since. Jamila disappeared into the hallway closet where she found an old overcoat Murray never wore anymore. In the pocket was an unfinished scarf and knitting needle stuck in a ball of wool that she removed, stuffing the jacket into her backpack. Hiding from Murray when he was just trying to be supportive was unkind, but she didn't want to explore her feelings right now. Jamila had met Murray in college, and she, he was the only one she felt safe talking about her past. She introduced Islam to him as the religion that had brought her nothing but pain, and still he decided to convert. That decision almost broke them up, but Murray felt that Jam Jamila's issues with her parents had more to do with culture than faith. Wanting her to marry someone from the same ethnic tribe in Pakistan, forbidding her from playing street hockey with the boys from the neighborhood, their kooky ideas about Halloween, these were the concerns of parents trying to find their way in the West, not religious zealots. After they finished their undergraduate degrees, Murray was accepted into dentistry school, but Jamila's dismal mark kept her out of medical school. Instead, she got a job at an insurance company and the two kept seeing each other. He proposed in his last year of school and wanted Jamila to introduce him to her parents. Their unhappiness at the engagement gave Jamila some satisfaction, but Murray insisted they postpone the wedding until her parents came around. They waited over a year until Nusrat started to worry about the de depreciation of Jamila's ovaries. For the sake of fleeting fertility, her parents reluctantly agreed to the marriage. Jamila overheard her mother tell some scandalized guests that Murray came from the northern regions of Pakistan, hence the white skin. Where are you going to find them, honey? Murray's voice pulled her back to the present. They're homeless. It's not like they have addresses, Jamila said. Remember, they're people, mom, said Lily. Jamila ignored her. The imam is coming with me. Brother Ibrahim from the mosque, asked Lily, dropping the spatula. Jamila found herself resenting Lily for being so shocked, but it wasn't her fault. Jamila always spoke about the mosque as if it were the hosting a reunion of the Third Reich. The one and only, said Jamila, it was his brilliant idea, something about God answering my prayers if I change the life of a homeless person. I love his Quran study classes, but the other kids think he's a little weird. Those kids know when to call it. The doorbell rang. Jamila was stuffing some socks into the knapsack, so Lily went to answer it and came back with Ibrahim, <clears throat> who was holding a large bag. Lily was chattering away, and I read the verses you assigned last week, the story about Adam being sent to Earth. What I don't understand is that even the angels didn't think creating humans was a good idea. They told God that we were going to mess things up on Earth, and we really weren't worth it. And all God said was, I know what you don't know. What did God know about us, Brother Ibrahim? Lily's eyes shone with delight as she talked to him. They never shone that way when she talked to Jamila. This is the question humans have been trying to answer since we were created, Ibrahim said. But I feel the answer may be that there are people like you, Malia, who are trying to make the earth a better place by caring so much about it. Call me Lily. Everyone else does. Ibrahim turned to Jamila. Your daughter is the best student in my class and so different from you. 
She takes after her father and uncle, said Jamila. She was proud of Lily, the one thing I did right. Suddenly, Ibrahim saw Murray and looked guilty. He introduced himself and shook Murray's hand. I enjoyed listening to your Friday sermon, said Murray. You're informative and livelier than the last guy. You attended, you att also attend the mosque, asked Ibrahim, since I converted, and I bring Lily to your classes every week. And since you came, I've never seen her so enthusiastic about going to the mosque. No one mentioned that Jamila was the holdout in the family. I hope you do not mind that I'm traveling alone with your wife. We will be in public at all times. Oh, it's totally fine, said Murray, keeping a straight face. I will make sure my hands are on the driver's wheel so no one will get the wrong impression. Relax, Ibrahim, said Jamila. People are going to think we're having an affair. Ibrahim winced. He pulled a scarf and mitt out of his bag. I was given many of these by people when I came to Liver Spot, so I feel that I can pass them on. He pulled out a plastic container with a sandwich in it was a sandwich in it. I learned how to make a grilled cheese sandwich too, which I understand from your wife is a powerful symbol in Western culture. Yeah, it's pretty powerful, all right, said Murray. I am not sure how Westerners came to believe that God speaks to them through a sandwich, but we must not disrespect their customs, said Ibrahim. White people do a lot of weird things, said Jamila, like getting themselves kidnapped on purpose to sell a book. Murray and Lily looked at each other and then at Jamila, who continued to pack things. Don't give me the side eye like I'm crazy. You two weren't in New York to see Courtney Leland sabotage my book launch. Mom, you think everyone's evil and out to get you. That's because they are. Has anyone seen Jamal's prayer beads? Asked Jamila, patting her coat pocket. I lost them yesterday. Ibrahim pulled out a string of marble beads from inside his jacket. I'm sorry, I didn't realize they belonged to you. They were on the floor of the mosque. He handed them back to her. Jamila gazed at them for a moment. They were his favorite. He never left the house without them. She tucked them away in her knapsack. Where are the two of you going exactly, asked Murray. My friend Anwar told me that many homeless people congregate at the park downtown near the shopping mall. It would be a good place to start, said Ibrahim. Well, no time like the present, said Jamila, as she filled another thermos with coffee. When she was done, Murray killed, kissed Jamila on the lips and held her hand. I'm really proud of you, honey. You've been trying new things lately, and that's good. But remember to look after yourself, too. If you get overwhelmed, just come back home and we'll talk. Why would I get overwhelmed? Jamila pulled her hands away. She didn't like it when Murray worried about her like this. It made her feel like a child. I'm over his death, Murray. I'm not doing this for some airy-fairy recovery process. I'm on a mission. Feed the homeless, make God happy, get onto the bestseller list. A simple quid pro quo arrangement. Murray saw Ibrahim squirm. I feel that we're missing an important part of the equation, said Ibrahim. We do it to please God. Jamila tightened the lid on the thermos and then turned it upside down to make sure it didn't leak. No, we do it so God gives us what we want and stops screwing us over with white privileged women. Bravo. Uh. <laughs> uh, thanks. So, I re yeah, I remember that chapter very distinctly. Um, but as soon as I, you know, as soon as I started reading the book, I think what struck me most about it was the tone and the energy. It's biting to say the least, and very different from what people know you best from, which is, you know, the rather lighthearted, family-friendly comedy of Little Mosque. Now, I understand the original title for Jamila Green was, in fact, The Rise and Fall of Dick. And so I have to ask, like, what was going on in the world, in your life, that you would write something with such, if you will, big dick energy? <laughs> Yeah, for all those who are wondering what happened to the title, the uh, publicist got together, sat me down one day and said, listen, we've let you believe this is going to be the title for a long time. But no, <laughs> we don't like it when we type it into Google and we get other images and we feel it's going to confuse things. <laughs> They had an intervention. They staged yeah. an intervention for you. I fought it for so long, Omar. I cannot tell you until I was worried I was going to lose the deal. So finally, I had to, you know, give it up. And then we all brainstormed. And then this is the title. And my children are like heartbroken, heartbroken <laughs> that it's gone. But yeah, I mean, it was 2014. My memoir, Laughing All the Way to the Moss, did not make it to the New York, New York Times bestseller list. <laughs> And I was like licking my wounds. Um, I, you know, I had struggled to make a television show for a long time after the Little Mosque, and, and none of it had come to fruition. Television is very, you know, a very competitive medium. And I was having a really kind of like downward 
spiral in my career and I was kind of spiritually struggling and kind of really angry at God for a lot of the, what I perceived as my professional failures and felt that God did not, you know, come through for me as I had hoped. <laughs> so, and I was just questioning the whole idea of prayer and the law and what does that mean? You know, what does it mean when you don't get what you want and you feel like you deserve it? And so I was kind of like in this bad place mentally. And I was like literally saying the same words that Jamila <laughs> was saying. And, you know, about privileged white women and how the whole industry seemed to be geared more towards them and not women of color. This is all you have to understand. This is 2014. This is before the whole movement that we have now with diversity. And even the word BIPOC hadn't been invented. And there had to be that much transparency in, in the literary world. And, and then it was 2014 and ISIS emerged. <laughs> And I was like, no, because <laughs> I always feel like we are forever battling the PR game when it comes to our image. And it's yeah. like, we will never get a break. And then this was like the worst thing possible. And I was like, oh, no. And then, you know, of course, you know, the pundits were like, oh, of course, you know, this is natural outgrowth of what Muslims do. Bill Maher said, I'm sure, you know, what did he say? He actually had a quote What of the 1.6, the 1.6 billion Muslims in the whole world all of them have some connective tissue to this group and their savage practices. And I was like, oh, come on. This is ridiculous. Like it was borderline crazy, like the stuff that was coming out. And I was like, that's it. That's it. I need to find out what caused this group to emerge. Like, like no one understood. Everyone was really confused. Muslims too. Like we were just like, what is happening? And so I started, it was hard to do research because the research, you know, nobody was writing. There weren't books about it. There, there was no, nothing was in context. No, no, people were genuinely confused. So I started following the news stories and I started writing the book and the book was following the news and I would progress. And then Jamila, her story was progressing as my life <laughs> was progressing along with hers. And at a certain point, I'm, I realized, oh my God, she's going to have to go to the Middle East. That her journey, like she has to actually become part of this group because so many people were joining and leaving and like i know a lot of people say to me this is a crazy story i'm like not that crazy yeah <laughs> these things were happening to ordinary people like i was reading a story in the new york times about a, a, like a young woman in kansas you know yes she, i remember that one i remember, remember that, that one. story just She's very young you yeah. know very naive woman it, the last person you would think that and, and i mean basically that her family had to stop her from going yeah. Otherwise, you know, she would have gone like if there she wasn't an intervention. Yeah, it was insane. And so when people tell me this book is nuts, I'm like, not really. <laughs> but but Jamila's not necessarily she's not going because she believes in the cause. The cause that she believes in is her own <laughs> is own herself <laughs> herself. That, right. So. <laughs> So it is, uh, yeah. So, but there is like, as as you've sort of denoted, some autobiographical, you know, at least you know, for Jamila's life before she goes off to Syria. I hope, um, and, and you know, and it's not, and it's not just because Jamila's an an author. Um, tell me how you grappled with, you know, your own crisis of faith through this character as well. I feel that. This, there's this verse in the Quran which repeats itself over and over again seek help through patience and prayer and I was like but for how long <laughs> and how patient and and what does that mean and, but but like there's a second part to that verse which says and this is hard for those that are not humble and that humbleness like I, I didn't really pick up pick up on that part right because I was like I am owed this success I, I deserve this success what is happening and then I would just be jealous and so envious of other people and and it would, it would become self-consuming. It's hard to explain. Like maybe you would understand as an artist, like our lives are so like, you know, transient in terms of our success. Like we don't have a nine to five job, but we just get a regular paycheck. We just live from project to project to project and some projects die and, so, you know, some projects do well and our egos and our sense, that sense of self and our identities get caught up in the work. Very much. And and you, I mean, of, you could, even even if you're up here today, in five <laughs> years, in two years, if you're not still at that same place, or even if you are, there are diminishing returns, as well. Yeah, and I think, like what you're saying, you if your identity and your sense of self is so caught up with your success, 
when you lose that, you tend to lose a sense of yourself. And I felt like I was losing myself. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was it was taking, you know, an effect on my family life, my marriage, myself. I was just like, what, you know, it was like kind of spinning out of control. And, and I sort of had to sort of center myself. I'm like, okay, if this is my faith, and if my faith is supposed to give me solace, then why aren't I finding it? And, and so I kind of react kind of reactivated the, those verses in the Quran. I'm like, what is, what is that missing? What am I supposed to be doing? And so I started, you know, the prayers and, and like, I need help and just guidance. And what should I be doing and open the right door? And how long did, should I give up on the book? Cause the, the book took six years. And, um, you know, my first publisher um, who had published my memoir had turned it down when the first draft is like, no, this is, you know, not, this is too much <laughs> This is for whatever they said. And so I, so then I had to, so then you're on your own and you have to write it on spec. And so I started hiring um, editors privately to help me work out the story and work out the comedy and work out, most of it was just figuring out how to work. Cause I was learning so much about the Middle East. I was reading and reading and reading. And, you know, I had to read a book, um, The Guest House for Young Widows by Azadeh Mu'aveni. I don't know if you've ever heard of this book. No. It she it was a um she's a journalist who actually studied the lives of twelve women who joined ISIS and followed their dreams, mm. and it was incredible. And each one came from a different country and a different background, a different perspective. And she explained politically, emotionally, what was happening in the Middle East at the time, the failed Arab Spring, and what it meant for people who were looking for some people just working for jobs and opportunity that was lost to them. Mm. People who felt they were going to to like a like a paradise, a cultural well, panacea of just social justice. There any that came close to Jamila Green's character because she <laughs> I mean when, no, she met yeah, people I would, like that yeah she yeah. met people like that on the way there but she herself she herself is someone who because of her selfishness yeah. she got the imam <laughs> she got the imam deported but no one will believe her because they think like she's such a terrible person and that she doesn't pray and she doesn't go to the mosque then suddenly she's starting to do all these things and then when she's yeah. then she's trying to explain That's to right. people listen he's gone and the, they think that maybe she's having a bit of a breakdown and she's exhausted and because everything seems fine the mom left a message on the phone i mean that. for for a character <laughs> like her uh, it's more likely that an imam would be an imaginary you know <laughs> would be an imaginary <laughs> friend than an actual person in her life uh, but but you know what I what I actually this is what I appreciate about this character the most is how unapologetically um, selfish she is, and and she is it, she's she's an antihero, but she's more than that. She's kind of an anti auntie, you know, like the kind of stereotypical Muslim motherly character we often get from pop culture is either like one dimensionally nurturing or one dimensionally oppressed. She is she is not that. I have to think it was maybe deliberate on your part, was it? Were you I mean, were you purposely trying to upend, you know, stereotypical portraits uh, or or um yeah, representation of of Muslim characters, Muslim female characters not, specifically? It's so it's interesting that you say that because I don't think I was doing that on purpose. Mm -hmm. I think that she's very much like me. Like my kids find me very um sometimes too internalized in terms of my own ambitions and not and not caring enough about the outside world and other people <laughs> and very focused on myself and i think she very much represented the type of person i was when i was writing the book but it's interesting that you say that because i think you're saying that is because we don't see that person on television or in books we see like very narrow representations of muslims right like like the, either the victim the wife of a tyrannical muslim man or someone who's throwing off the hijab for the sake this, of and specifically for that age of of muslim woman as well you know a, a woman like you know a woman who is who is middle-aged um or or older you you do have some pretty you know um increasingly with with shows like rami and and we are lady parts um or you know the um oh the name escapes me um uh yeah i can't remember it um you do have, you know, young Muslim women who are kind of, you know, they, they do break stereotypes. But I feel like for for the middle aged Muslim woman that, you know, Jamila Green is, it is uh, 
it's it's pretty radical for that for that kind of person for that kind of character thank you yeah i can't I can't be honest and say I was trying to break stereotypes. I was just writing and I was middle aged. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe it, I mean if you're if you're all if you are just channeling yourself and you are breaking a stereotype uh just by being then that's that's probably what it is. By being a horrible person, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean so you know, I'm I'm curious to know though, there you know, with uh with the the terror group, what why why Dick? I mean, you know, why not just call it ISIS? I mean, obviously you lose out on a lot of the the great Dick jokes. Um, my favorite being um, Abd- Abdullah is what we call a soft Dick, as opposed to <laughs> Talal, the leader, the hardest Dick of all. Um, but I could also see a version of this that kind of tackles the foreign policy critique that's at at the the heart of this. Um, and that led to ISIS. I can see a version of this that tackles it maybe head on by treating ISIS as it is. And so tell me about your your decision there uh, and, in, and in other places as well to fictionalize or not to fictionalize true events because Syria and what's going on there at that time and place is real. And there, there are other things that are, you know, uh, are uh, references to true, you know, true events uh, that we will recognize from, you know, from the headlines of the last five, six years. But uh, yeah, how are you making those decisions? Well, all the political stuff is true. All, it all happened. The only thing that's fiction is the name of the group. And I decided that I wanted to, the best way to, because people are so afraid and, and like there was so much terror when that group first came out. People mm-hmm. were really, really scared. And I, and the best way to take terror out of something and fear out of something is to mock it mm-hmm. and to make fun of it. So that's what I wanted to do was to say, you know, we are, you know, it's one thing that Atle um, Mo'avani said in her book, The Guest House for Young Widows, is like we created almost a demonology around this group as if it was the worst thing that had ever happened since the beginning of time. <laughs> like we were behaving yeah. like that. And it wasn't true. And we can see it now with what's happening in Ukraine, and people are, you know, quite shocked by the horrors of Ukraine. But these horrors happen all the time. They're happening all the time all over the world. Different groups of people, and so I wanted to deflate that balloon and mm-hmm. say, let's let's bring this down and let's make fun of it and mock it, and so mm-hmm. that people can kind of get their minds around it. And I was really angry at that group for what they did, and so I wanted to give it to them. <laughs> I live in Saskatchewan, so it's fine. Sure. <laughs> there, no one would be like, where is she? You. <laughs> now, <laughs> does this have anything to do with, you know, so, so what, first I should ask, what, when did you finish, when did, when did you first start to try to shop around the book? Was it around 2016, 17? Yeah, so in, in 2014, yeah, so, my, so I, um, I finished my last book, it was released 2014, and so I started writing. It just it took about six months to write, and so then I sh- gave it to the publisher, and the publisher said no, and then began the uh-huh. long the long journey. Every year I would hire a new editor and rewrite it, and then the editors were like, "It's not ready yet to give it back to your agent." So then I would rewrite it. Okay. So it's not ready yet. By the sixth editor, she's like, "Okay, how many editors have you gone through?" <laughs> and and I said about you know five, and she's like, "Okay, you know what? The, of all the manuscripts I've gotten from people who are helping asking for help, this is the best one." It's ready. It's polished. There are some things you need to fix. And she helped me fix it. She goes, give it back to your agent. It's ready now. Because I was starting to get addicted a little bit to the editor <laughs> because I never had written a novel before. And it's a really difficult medium. Like if you, like mm-hmm. people just think, you know, you could just do it. But there's a lot, you know, I had been a trained sitcom writer, right. which is a different medium entirely. Like going into people's heads and thinking about their emotions and feelings. We don't do that in television. Mm-hmm. And and so I was like almost getting a like a creative writing degree. And so by the time I finished, I handed it to my agent. She's like, wow, this is, you know, way better than you, the first draft. And within, you know, within days, she was able to sell it in the U.S. and in, and in Canada. Oh, amazing. Okay. So, so you, I mean, you spoke, you, you spoke about how, you know, you struggle to sell it. Um, it kind of, uh, well, you know, maybe, maybe you tell me if the, if the timing kind of matches up, because you were trying to sell it around the time uh, that, the attack on uh, Charlie Hebdo happened. And so I have to wonder, was it just that, you know, early 
publishers who looked at it thought it was too out there or over the top? Or was it that they thought it was too touchy that they, they did they fear that it would provoke, you know, radical Islamists the way that other writers like Urshad Manji or like I said, Charlie Hubdo have, which would have been very fresh in people's minds at the time that you were shopping it around? No, it's, that's a really good question. Uh, I had never even considered that because like, they never mm-hmm. really give you a reason. They mm-hmm. just say like we you know we don't think the satire is good enough or it's not working mm. and that's it and you're like oh <laughs> so then you go back, but I think you're right. I think that this book really could not have come out at any other time than the time we're in now, because the narrative of who's dangerous has shifted away from Muslims and Islam somewhat because now it's the rise of white terror. We see what happened in Ottawa with the convoys and you know I I hear journalists on television and radio like you know i can hear the incredulity in their voices going this you know these are terrorists they're threatening democratic institutions you know all these words you know that were always associated with islam and muslims are now being given to white people and and it was incredible hearing the story it is yeah i mean the rise the rise of donald trump really seems to have configured things differently in people's minds you know the um you know the 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 gatekeepers of uh, not just publishing, but uh, but I think even more so television and film stories that they wouldn't you know stories about uh, not just about Muslim people but by Muslim people that there didn't seem to be any interest in suddenly where we seem to be living in at least for the Western world a bit of a golden age for it. You're right. And so it was the answer to the prayer that I had made. How patient do you have to be? Donald Trump was the answer to the prayer. <laughs> it was true. Take it, was it back. True. Take it back. <laughs> I actually wrote an article, an op-ed for the Globe and Mail, where I said, like that man, it was like it was like our magic fairy godmother just like waved her wand and said, that's it. You guys have done your time with the headlines and newspapers. White people are taking over. And I was like, never did I think I would live to see that like i know people get angry at me when i say like i'm donald trump was great for for many things <laughs> in the sense that he gave voice and power to the white supremacists and that and and they rose up and people's eyes were finally opened to this other terror group and, because up to that point it was muslims muslims, muslims day and night headlines and it, yeah, and, and it was terrible and, and when you try to bring up bring uh, get people to focus on you know, I mean, it's not like what, what Donald Trump happened and then white supremacy, came, white, these, yeah. these white terror groups just like appeared. No, they were always there. <laughs> that was always but when there. you tried to bring attention to them, I felt like, you know, people looked at me like I was crazy or like like a Cassandra, you know. Yeah. And then it was, you know, after almost immediately after he was elected, you have this horrific shooting at the Quebec City Mosque, which had an A to B you know, correlation between Donald Trump and that attack. And that's when I felt like people started to finally take Islamophobia and the mainstreaming of Islamophobia very seriously. It just, it woke people up. A thousand percent. And, and I'm kind of grateful for that because before things were really bad for us in terms of media headlines. And now people are scared of a different group. And and as you mentioned, I don't think my book could have come out any earlier than the, like this was the perfect time for it yeah. because we can now look at that period of terrorism in context. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, so your I mean, your book still took uh, you know your book still took a, a some time mm-hmm. to to find its place. Um, I was reading that wonderful profile of you in McLean's last month. And, um, you know, I learned that that you kind of experienced somewhat of a divine moment last <laughs> fall on September 21st. Simon & Schuster offered you a deal for the novel. And then a few hours later, CBC Gem offered you a deal on your new show, Zarka, which we'll talk about in a moment here. Um, now, what what you don't know is that September 21st also happens to be the same day that my book about oh. Muslims in the Americas was released. <laughs> And so I like to think that, you know, God was feeling very generous toward Muslim artists that day. Um, yeah. But really, though, I, I mean, that that double dose of good news, 
after a long, you know, a years long struggle as an artist. And as you just laid out as an artist, just like so much of your spirit is kind of entangled in your success. What was that day for you like? And, and I think maybe more importantly, like as a person of faith, what does that day mean to you now? What do you think it will, you know, it, it will represent to you in the future? When I was telling the journalist, because she goes, well, how did you feel? And I said, I, well, I felt immense happiness and joy. But I immediately told myself, remember this feeling because you thought you would never be here again. You convinced yourself it was over. Like you convinced yourself you were never going to get this book published. You were never going to get another television deal, that it was all over. And, you know, it was a long, long journey to get here. But I mean, they both, the fact that they happened on the same day was like, I could tell it was a sign, like it was a sign, like, you know, this is the answer to the prayer of you have to be patient, you have to pray and you have to be humble and not, not to be arrogant in the self and what you think you deserve and that you have to give to others and you have to look outward and, and be, first of all, be grateful for what you have. You have a home, you have, you know, you have light, electricity, warmth, food for days, right? more food than you know what to do with you're in a good relationship, you have good children. I mean, we're, we're in peace. Like, like you don't, you have to take care of, like you have to acknowledge what you have and then take care of the people around you who don't have what you have and stop thinking constantly about why aren't I number one, why aren't I, you know, like that humbleness. So, I mean, I, I felt like I needed to get to this other place emotionally and mentally. And then when, when the, that call came, those two calls came, I felt, remember this moment, so that if you ever go through that same downward spiral, you can say to yourself, you know, it, these are cyclical and you have to be patient and you have to, you know, look after other people besides yourself and stop thinking about yourself so, so much. And and it come you come out of it. And and so, I mean, it was a good lesson to learn. And it's something that I'm, I'm hanging on to very, very deeply because it was so like a miraculous that it happened like that. And you didn't even have to go to Syria. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> though, though you would have if that's what it took. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, we are, you know, we're we're near the end, but we we obviously we uh, or, or near the end, near the 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 question, you know, er, uh, uh, period. So we'll open it up for for uh, Q and A pretty soon. But um, we have to talk about Zarka. Oh yeah. Uh, I watched the trailer. I was getting serious. Jamila Green vibes, and so can you can tell everyone about it, and and maybe tell us also what these two projects have in common. The idea came for me. I was um, reading all these think pieces by brown Muslim women. After, have you heard of the movie The Big Sick? Yeah, of course. So yeah, The Big Sick comes out, and all these women, Muslim women, women of color, BIPOC women, start writing these really angry, angry pieces. And they were about how Hollywood, if there's a man of color, he'll date like women of color, but they'll be like the disposable comic foils that are like less interesting and, and um, damaged or somehow not worthy until the white princess <laughs> comes, who is the one that truly is to be desired. And 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 and, and I, I, like, they were so angry, right? And, and they had said that all these other shows at the time we're following the same trend and i thought that was hilarious <laughs> what's so funny the backlash you thought the backlash was hilarious no, I, well, well, the, well i thought that that th like the idea came to me that instead of getting mad <laughs> if that happened to a woman what like you know because the women were complaining that the the brown man got his white trophy <laughs> so i said well let's do a show where a brown muslim her her ex-husband you know taunts her on Facebook and says, I'm getting married to a white yoga instructor ha half her age. And that's his white trophy. And she, he's a podiatrist, like a foot doctor, nothing against podiatrists. So she <laughs> counters him and says, Oh, that's nice. I'll be there with my plus one, Brian, the brain surgeon, the white brain surgeon, <laughs> the highest of the echelon <laughs> she can find to get her revenge. And so they're going to go after each other trophy <laughs> for trophy, right? But that's what I got. But there's a catch. There is no Brian with the surgeon. So she has to find one. She has to find Brian. <laughs> so and she does. Like she goes on a she goes on a dating app. She doesn't know how to date. She's like, you know, so she goes on a dating app. She finds a Brian. But Brian really wants a relationship. 
like a proper relationship. Mm. He doesn't want to be revenge arm candy. So it's a comedy about how she has to string him along on these dates long enough to make it to the wedding. Mm. And so that's where the idea came from <clears throat> for that for that show. Sorry. <laughs> uh well, uh, that, it's great. I'm so looking forward to it. when. When does it? When does it um, premiere? It's on CBC Gem May the yes. May thirteenth. As long as we deliver on time, we're just finishing up the credits, which is like never <laughs> leave that to the last minute, Omar. I'm telling you right I now. I know. I know. <laughs> it's killing me. So anyway, um, hopefully we we deliver next week, and if everything is fine technically, then inshallah May thirteenth you will see a short form web series, six episodes, ten minutes each. And and CBC Gem. You can binge them. It's all they're all premiering at the same time. Yeah, Fantastic. one would hope. That's <laughs> one would hope the That's CBC great. wouldn't make you watch ten minutes and wait a week. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> maybe they would. I don't know. Uh, but but this this is this is hopefully not the end of of Zarka. Just this one short, you know, uh, series of of ten minute episodes. Um, t- tell me, tell me how this is a proof of concept. You were saying before the the event started, so you're hoping to do something bigger with this. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. So the idea was I wanted to own my own production, like the little mosque on the prairie. I was, you know, in the writing room. That's where I learned a lot about the writing process, but I never learned about what it took to put a whole show together. And I wanted to make a web series because I own the IP. It's my idea, and my company owns the project. But I wanted to understand the nuts and bolts of television making from the very top down, mm. right? From from negotiating with agents to doing post production, you know, to, to learning like what, you know sound mixing, the whole bit. Um, and and it, because really, a short form is exactly the same as a long form. Just it's much, you know, just it's it's long form is just you know more money, but the complications are all the same, and. In order to learn nuts and bolts, who to hire, who not to hire, what are all, what are all the positions? What's the first AD? What's the first AC? What's the second AD? Who are all these people? What are they doing? What are their roles? And to understand every single person and every single role, where they fit, and where it's important to hire really strong people for certain things, where you can get mentorship for other things. Like I wanted to really understand the whole process. So by the time we get to half an hour, I will be in a different place. There's a huge push in the production world that people, you know, BIPOC people shouldn't just work for other people's shows but they should own production companies mm. and own their own television shows and have that t- level of control and in order to get there you have to learn the system and right. that was a great learning curve for me um if anyone has any questions please pop them in the either the the group chat um or the q a mm-hmm. um tab of your of your zoom um now you you mentioned you know, having more control and and the desire to own your own IP. Um, I have to ask: Was that you know was that a lesson learned from your experience uh, with Little Mosque? You know, I I know that there were times when you know you wanted to you wanted to push a little you know push some boundaries with the show, um, but weren't able to. Um, you talked about this in your McLean's uh, McLean's profile: how you wish that. You know, at times, you were maybe a little bit more aggressive about, uh, you know, with with social critiques and whatnot. Um, tell tell me about your experience with Little Mosque, uh, or at least r- rather what you learned from Little Mosque and the importance of, you know, having creative control as you did with this book and as you do with Zarka. Yeah, it was harder because in those days, it was the white men who were in charge, and it was my first show. And so you, you, you know, you would kind of have to work with them or get their permission or the permission of the broadcaster or the producers. So it was always like you were trying to, you know, um, walk this very delicate line. Plus, the Muslim community was like freaking out when the show first came out because they couldn't handle it because they were like it was the first comedy about Muslims they had ever seen, anyone had ever seen. Mm-hmm. And the, but, you know, it wasn't a couch in the living room type of show of a Muslim family. It was in the mosque. <laughs> it was about Islam and it was a comedy. So everyone was just like on edge, and the Muslims were, you know, really, really upset in the first year. They were really? some of them were trying to get yeah they were trying to get it off the air. They Why? Were petitioning. Because they felt like the older community, the um, there was a big um, split between the children and uh-huh. their parents. And their parents, because uh-huh. comedy isn't universal, and their parents were worried. They couldn't get the comedy. They thought that I was making fun of Islam. It was too and haram. Was like, 
yes exactly and i was like i'm i'm making fun of muslims um but i'm not making fun of islam and they're like no but we are you're making fun of people like us and we are muslims and that's yeah. we represent islam and that's it's islam and and so they just couldn't see it where their kids were laughing and having a good time and they were like tell me that you're not disrespecting islam and so there's a the schism between the first generation and the second generation oh, and the first generation were the ones who control the mosques and you know my husband was the president of the mosque in regina and the poor guy he had to um recuse himself when the board had to deal with oh my the gosh. issue of the wife and the problems right? oh my gosh and so I knew that we could only push so far because the community was already like on edge. Yeah. And so I had to kind of be, I was trying to explain to like, you know, white men in a, in a writing room, like, look, we can do so certain things, but we have to be careful because this community is already mm. freaking out. And so, you know, now today. So, so some of those boundaries you, you put up yourself to, to sort of try to get it, you know, prevent any further backlash. Well, I remember, like, I remember one scene where the, like the, what, I think it was the, one of the executives wanted the imam to check out uh someone's butt as as she bent over and i said you know the moms that i know wouldn't really do that right they seem they're very upstanding men and he's like no like i'm gonna have it done anyway and so he did and i remember kind of thinking mm -hmm. to myself like this is not authentic to my experience like this mm -hmm. is not what i see in my community but they thought it was funny and it was worth doing and and things like that would happen and i would be like this isn't really authentic to my like it should be authentic to my experience what i see and what's going on and they were like, yeah, we think it's funny. And so then I realized that they didn't really care what I thought sometimes. Mm. Like they would just override my decisions because for, for the sake of a joke. And I was like, you know, this is a community that we're representing. And we have, if we're going to represent them, we have to do it authentically. And so little things like that would happen. And so I realized that like if you're not the person in power and in control, it's, you know, then you can't ultimately make those decisions. And I wanted to be that person. And so my husband gave me the best advice and he was like, you know, try to because there were a lot of politics happening in the time because it was CBC's number one show in twenty years, and everyone was trying to. Mm -hmm. you know, everyone was pushing, which and, which I would think would would make you, you know, queen of the set. You know, you whatever think, Zarka right? says goes, but not quite. No, it was like white people fighting with white people <laughs> for supremacy, and so I kept my head down and I had just learn the 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 craft of writing, like become the best writer in this room, become the best person, so that when the next opportunity comes you can not only be the best writer in the room but you can also learn the nuts and bolts of putting things together and combine those two skills together and make it even better and stronger show hmm. we still don't have any questions but i'm i'm i i have no end of questions so if uh you know y'all out there are just going to let me dominate this entire event here um that so so given that experience it must have been really freeing then to write uh, Jamila Green. Um, but I also wonder, is that why, you know, you fought so hard on certain things like the title, you know, was, was because of, you know, that, uh, yeah, I don't know, just, just w wanting to avoid maybe repeating some regrets that you, you had in the past, like the, you know, the, I don't know, the imam checking out the, <laughs> the woman's butt or, <laughs> Uh, I know there was a there was a character a Nakabi character that you you know you wish yeah. that you had done more with in in the show. She should have spoken like she should have spoken and had her own voice and mm -hmm. been her own character as opposed to just being observed and commented upon. Mm -hmm. And that had been a mistake. Um, like I remember when I was writing the book, one of the editors said, "Maybe you shouldn't make this character go overseas. Maybe this book is just too zany. You should just have her stay in North America." And I kind of pushed back and I said, "No." Like this is not a this is not a crazy story. This is a story of some lot people are move have been leaving to go to the over you know go overseas to join ISIS for a while now. This is a tr this is a story. This is real. Like oh like Maher um, Arar was disappeared <laughs> when he was on his way back to Canada. You know, it, and the Canadian and American governments were both in cahoots with that. And his wife Monia Mazig had to, you know. Um, protest in front of the le in front of uh, in Ottawa for a year and the, with the late NDP leader Alexa McDonough. I mean, I read I remember reading Monia's memoir and she was saying they were people in government who were actively working against her to get her husband to come home. Mm -hmm. And those stories were insane. And and so when you know in the book when Ibrahim has disappeared, I was telling the editor like these things happen. <laughs> Right. And it's our not governments a were no. This, this, our governments were complicit in some of this stuff, 
And so it's not a crazy story. Like I'm telling you, <laughs> this story has to happen in the way I'm writing it. And and I, and I had to like to stick with that belief and know in your heart that, that the story is real. It's a good story. It's a story worth telling. It's funny and it's heartwarming and it has all those elements of a, you know, a spy novel and, 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 you know, it's ground, it's ground in character. Like, like I felt like it, this was worth publishing and worth believing in. And so I waited and, and persevered. And, and so that's what I tell people when, like, like if you're going to be in the arts and if you're going to be in publishing or television, it's not for the faint, the Mm -hmm. faint of heart, you have to be ready, you know, to, to persevere and work hard for years and years and years and not give up. It's a tough you know, industry. I, I saw you at a, at a panel about, um, you know, uh, Muslim Muslim stories and art and um, storytelling in, in the screen arts at the Moscars last month. <clears throat> and Hamza Haq, the, the actor Hamza Haq, was on the panel with you. And he said something that has stuck with me. I probably repeat it to myself every week now. And he <laughs> said, um, if someone can you know if someone can talk you out of doing something or, or out of doing it as in like pursuing your your artistic dream uh if someone can talk you out of doing it don't do it you have like you have to be so committed and to a point of, of stubbornness to really make yeah. it in in these industries no he's a he's a thousand percent right i mean i would have to say that I can't be anything else but a storyteller. Like it's too ingrained in what I want to do and what I'm only capable of doing with my life. I don't find satisfaction and I've tried to break out. <laughs> like I've, you know, I've been a broadcaster for CBC. Yeah. I had a chance Recently. to like, yes, I had a chance to just have a good salary, just, you know, makeup budget, clothes budget, be an anchor of the news. And, and, you know, like it wasn't satisfying that deep, internal need that mm-hmm. I had of creativity and the burning desire to tell story and it, you know and I was just like fooling myself and finally I got, like one of my friends relative looked turned around she was he's like you're throwing your life away like for yeah. what like why are you doing this but I'm like okay all right like you know don't regret doing it sometimes you need to take a break yeah and go some sideways and do something else to recharge your kind of creative batteries did and, it help with acting because I mean, you know, we didn't we didn't it, talk about the fact that you are the star of Zarka. You're an actor. It did help with acting because you're forced to perform. Like reading a script in front of you know people is performance is performance based. Because mm-hmm. b- being behind the scenes writing, you know, in front of your computer for years, <laughs> really learned to perform very much. But this forces you to come out of your shell, and you know, project and you know, pretend to be an authority figure. <laughs> I can't believe we forgot to mention that you you are also the star of Zarka. So just just to just to summarize, um, you are a novel. You're a novelist. You're a memoirist. You're a screenwriter. You're a producer and showrunner. Stand up comedian. Uh, journalist. Um, columnist. Uh, TV anchor and actor. Did I miss anything? No, that's a lot. I never thought of it that way. <laughs> Amazing. Um, I mean, wow. What I mean, what a you're you're a yeah, you're a gem. You're you're a, you're a national treasure, and it's such a it's so great to have this this conversation with you. Um, I think I'm going to uh, we'll we'll wrap it up here. Uh, Ramadan Mubarak to everyone. Thank you. Um, I hope you you get to enjoy the rest of your. <laughs> Uh, your iftar now. Um, I think Jorge, are you coming on to to say a, a couple of things? Uh, what a pleasure to listen to both of you talk. And we could have gone for hours. This was incredible. Thank you so much for sharing so generously, Sarka and Omar. You're you're such a phenomenal moderator, and your questions obviously left everyone quiet because we didn't want to jump in and interrupt. I was having so fun. You, we could tell. Um, thank you so much for doing this, both of you. And thank you to everyone who joined um, and spending your evening with us. I'm going to show you the book again. Here it is. I encourage you all to go buy it from your favorite local bookstore. Um, and yeah. <laughs> nice. And if you want to watch the event again or you want to share with your friends, um, I know that some people can't join events when they're streaming. Uh, it was a lovely afternoon in Vancouver. So some people probably were out in the park. 
But um, this event was live streamed to the library's YouTube channel, and we always do that so that people can see them afterwards. So we're sharing the link now so that you can all share it there. We're going to be sharing it on our socials so people can watch it later. Um, I have a quick favor to ask everyone. We would love it if you gave us feedback about this event. As a public institution, it really is very important that we do programs that work for you, our audience, because you are paying for them with your taxes. So we want to share a link in a form in the chat, which should take you about a minute to fill out. And it doesn't go into a dark hole of the internet. We actually sit down and read your comments and it helps inform what the audience wants to see and how the events uh, go. So take a second to fill it out. And uh, if you want to hear about more events, we obviously have, uh, we promote them through all of our social media. We have a newsletter that you can sign up for. And I'm going to take a second to tell you about two wonderful events coming up. Um, and Candy's going to share some slides of them so you can see visually uh, what is coming up. So we're hosting an event with Pulitzer winning novelist Jennifer Egan um, next week for her new novel. And she's going to appear in conversation with Cory Doctorow, who's one of Canada's best known science fiction writers. That's next week. And then uh, the week of April 21st, uh, Candy's actually hosting a conversation about the history of black cowboys and ranchers in Western Canada with filmmaker Cheryl Fogo and writer Bertrand Bickerstedt. So those are gonna be really exciting. Um, so please come to them. We also have a series called Up Upliftation that has been running all of March and we have more programs coming in April. So check that out as well. Um, and that's it. That's all I have for now. Thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, thank you, Sarka. Thank you, Omar. It was a pleasure. And pleasure yeah. And uh, we're gonna keep the event open for another few minutes for the audience to be able to click on links, but um, Omar Sarka, we are, uh, are gonna get off the stage at this point, but thank you so much for being here. Thank All you, right. VPL. Thank you. Bye. Have a good night. Thank you so much. Bye.